language that gets processed on this distributed computer. And, you know, with computing um, hardware being, you know, over the past, I guess, like a couple of decades, we've had computing hardware becoming faster and, you know, more um, higher performant. Um, I was thinking that having a distributed computer kind of changes the the need for like it, it's kind of it's it's this weird like paradigm shift where you know having the computing resources um, for yourself to use is kind of less needed now that you have a distributed computer that does all the heavy computing for you right so with a distributed environment or decentralized um, computing platform it kind of focuses the attention more on like individual wise it focuses the attention on the individual to invest more in programming and in the software side than investing in hardware so you wouldn't really you know like like right now i'm like running this slideshow on my mac and you know it's really expensive macs are super expensive um but i see like in the future like there's less of a value on you know having this fancy piece of hardware when the hardware you're really going to be leveraging to to you know open up your browsers in the future um or like you know run some machine learning computation would be in this distributed environment um so yeah that's just some food for thought it was an idea i had um and you know we're still like in this kind of I would say like transition period from like um, computing resources and uh, cloud computing resources and computing that's still done in the cloud, like Amazon Web Services, to transitioning into this distributed environment. Because um, you know we we don't really have these big corporations that are leveraging these technologies, at least not yet. So it's yet to be seen um, of how this affects like economies, global economies. Okay, can I have a question, Jason? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm interested in uh, uh, so, so for Eastern, uh, because what I know about AWS, for, for, the, for instance, AWS, that there's some computer located somewhere physically. There, there's a supercomputer somewhere, right? And uh, yeah. we're just using cloud to have access to, to that computer. So. If, if Eastern is a distributed computer, then I mean, uh, I mean, and you said uh, we are focusing less on the hardware, but uh, I'm assuming there has to be some, I mean, someone who have physical possession of some computer somewhere so yeah. that other people can use the computer computer power, right? Yeah. So, like, the, you would still have servers running that would make up the the blockchain like you know you would have that like in this image for example you have like these dots would represent i guess you could say like collections of ethereum nodes or you know servers collections of servers that would be um upholding the blockchain you know processing transactions um they, they would you would still have these physical hardware devices you know the servers still running to perform these computations but they would be more they would be they wouldn't be as centralized and you wouldn't have the it, it kind of shifts the power of like who's in who's in charge of this hardware and with within a distributed environment i think it it levels the playing field in terms of who can get involved in this uh, distributed computing environment both from the software side and like who can develop the applications to be run in this distributed environment and also who can purchase the hardware to support this distributed environment so with with ethereum like you you don't necessarily need this like really really expensive like twenty thousand um, dollar you know set of servers to like run um or to like support the ethereum blockchain um, you know compare that to amazon web services where they have you know warehouses full of like data warehouses you know like filled of servers and like you know have the it department managing this stuff so um it's i think the, the significance is like shifting the power away where instead of you have 
you know, the, the very wealthy people, the wealthy corporations can, you know, afford the heart, the hardware to support these distributed computing environments. Um, you know, I could, I could spin up an Ethereum node and, you know, be contributing to the Ethereum blockchain, though, it, you know, that, that contribution will be very, very small relative, you know, to the whole grand scheme of things of, you know, the rest of the world. But, you know, I, I don't need, uh, like, yeah, like I, to, to get involved with Amazon Web Services, to contribute to that um, computation environment, it, you know, there, there's a hurdle to that. There's less of a barrier to entry with uh, some, a distributed computing platform like the Ethereum blockchain. Um, another question is that, for example, if I want to act, uh, execute a program on, on Ethereum blockchain, then for example, there, there are 10 decentralized uh, personal computers that are doing the, running the program for me, as opposed to mm -hmm. using AWS, there is just one centralized supercomputer running the program. Is that, is that difference between the two? Um, are you asking in terms of like, uh processing speed yeah well i mean i'm i'm, I'm uh, because uh i'm just not i still don't really quite understand how the decentralization in in the physical uh computer physical the hardware the, in terms of yeah the physical hardware because uh without any centralized uh I mean, supercomputer like they have in AWS, so that doesn't mean that people are using, for example, if I'm not using my computer right now, then I'm, I'm lending out my computer computing power to someone else who want to use Ethereum to, to execute any program. Is that how this works? Yeah, so you, you can think of it like that. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't technically be, um, like you, you don't really have a control over what what kind of um, transactions you're processing, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. And the in this environment, in, the, in like this distributed computing environment, the the people that have or like you know groups of people that have lots of computing resources are tech are technically doing most of the. Um, computation processing in this environment. So it, it's still, it still mirrors the, the kind of centralization of, you know, Amazon Web Services data warehouses, but the barrier, the barrier to entry is different because what you can, like who, like the, who can access this distributed computing environment? Anyone can really access it and who can join this like to, provide hardware to support the distributed computing environment. Anyone can really join this computing environment. Mm -hmm. Whereas with, um, you know, Amazon Web Services, you might need, you know, certain kinds of hardware, like specific hardware to support certain kinds of machine learning applications, you know, like, you know, some fancy GPUs, right? Or in, in this environment, you could theoretically, I, I haven't seen it been done yet, but you know, if you, theoretically you could perform machine learning computations on the Ethereum blockchain. I'll let the Ethereum blockchain you know, process your machine learning computation. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, this is probably a stupid question, but <laughs> thanks for answering. Yeah, um, I mean, this is, this is all like, you know, I'm like speaking in terms of like theory and not in terms of like what's actually being done yet. So like this distributed computer, um, I, like mental model, if you will, is I think not really going through a lot of people's minds. So I, I want to emphasize that because this, this um, portrayal of the Ethereum blockchain is future looking. Like what, what Ethereum blockchain can do now, or like, you know, Bitcoin or any other blockchain, um, but I'm just focusing on Ethereum blockchain right now. Mm -hmm. um, what the Ethereum blockchain can do now, I think is just, you know, the tip of the iceberg of what a distributed platform could do. So this is, I think, the most important piece uh, to understand about um, blockchains is that it's a distributed computing platform or distributed computing environment where you can build applications on and they can, this distributed computing environment can run the programs of these 
applications you build on top of them. Any other questions? Okay, um, I'm gonna move on. Um, so supply chains, recently with COVID-19 crisis, there's been a decent amount of talk. Um, I've even seen some, you know, on, on my LinkedIn, um, the talks about supply chain being disrupted with, um, you know, food, food being disrupted, food supply chain being disrupted. You have uh, farmers um, having to um, sadly kind of find ways to get rid of like pork or, um, you know, cattle. Um, these are just some articles I found online that kind of go into ways that supply chains would be disrupted and like what, what to, how to make them more resilient. And um, I'll share the slides so you can like look at these. Um, I've, I'm not going to dive into them because I've been more focusing on getting insight from actual people in supply chain management. I've, I've been working with a professor in um, Gies who's uh, runs the Masters of Accounting um, program and she introduced us to a professor in Gies who teaches um, supply chain management and you know he's providing us some more technical details about supply chain management and what goes into that. Um, and from that, uh, from that, we've been developing this simulator from this, a lot of this information that we've been getting from our meetings, um, with the disruption lab and with our team. And the goal is to build an autonomous supply chain management, um, should change that, um, goals kind of changed. It, the goal is to build a su autonomous supply chain management system and it's different than just a supply chain manager because with this autonomous supply chain system we are having the autonomous um, programs that we code on the back end helping the decisions of the supply chain managers that are still in charge of managing the supply chain operations um, and, you know, here are some other goals, create an easy to use interface for managers, which I'll, um, show you a bit. This is also changed. Um, the, the interface is more focused on educating students where the students are in this case, the managers and each of the students would take on a role of a different party in the supply chain and be able to see the, the, the consequences of their actions in this environment and whether those actions are positive or negative, they'd be able to see um, how that affects the supply chain in this blockchain based setting. And obviously with this application, we would have the blockchain handle information flows via transactions. And this would be built on the Ethereum blockchain, which I mentioned earlier. And here's kind of just a general structure that we recently came up with. And this is all like still in development. So this structure here is prone to change, but to dive into it, we have the general supply chain network. So the parties that would be involved in this supply chain being the farmer, a freight forwarder that connects one node in the supply chain network to another was just transferring the purpose of the freight board is just to transfer the, the product, the physical product to the next node. So you have a farmer shipping some corn, for example, to the manufacturer and then the manufacturer shipping some, um, you know, cereal to the customer. Um, you know, there, there'd be other steps in between these, but this is just a simplified version of the supply chain network. And we have a general framework of how we want to capture the processes that are happening on supply chain. And these processes would 
take the form of the manufacturer buying 15 cocoa beans, that's what the CB stands for, buying 15 cocoa beans or 15 packages or pallets, you know, like this um, like large collection of cocoa beans. So buying 15 shipments of cocoa beans, if you will, from Farmer 3. And, you know, you can imagine there's, there's you know, many farmers in this supply chain network, not just one farmer. And there'd be many different for many manufacturers and not just one manufacturer, same for, you know, customers as there's different products as well. So this is like a general idea of how we want to portray the processes going on in the back end. And in addition to this process that gets um, processed on the Ethereum blockchain, um, we have a communication, um, some, some communication go going on in this process that gets pushed to the front end in this application. So we intend to, for every process that, or for every transaction, um, which is what the process box really shows, is just like the, the transactions that are being done on this blockchain or in this supply chain network, on, a, blah, on this blockchain-based supply chain environment. So for every transaction in this processes box that gets done, we have some, some form of communication that's being sent or emitted to the front end and also to the blockchain. But what the front end will be doing will be capturing this um, higher level information and then showing it to the users of this supply chain, um, blockchain based supply chain application. So this front facing, this user facing information would be stuff like the address and this address would indicate who is who is doing the buying, who's doing the receiving. And that could be like, you know, farmer two or farmer three. And, you know, more information could be also added to that transaction as well. Perhaps the farmer bought these, um, or perhaps the manufacturer bought these 15 packages of cocoa beans from farmer three, and he received them. And after he received them, he, he, he realized that like, you know, some of the cocoa beans were bad and didn't want to accept this package from the farmer. So, you know, that, that information is then, you know, emitted to the blockchain that this farmer had at post receiving these cocoa beans. He then posts on the blockchain through, you know, our user interface, um, you know, probably clicking like a button or like entering in a very, very simple form, just like, you know, how was your receipt of your purchase? Um, so he would enter in bad, bad beans, no accept. And these, these, um, these transactions with their, um, communication labels, if you will, will be shown on the blockchain via breadcrumbs, which is something that we want to provide on the user facing side so that the users of the blockchain or of this blockchain based application will be able to see um, the, tr the traces or the history of these user facing um, this, this user facing information. So if I was a supply chain manager and I saw on the manufacturers side that um, this like one of my manufacturers for um, my product didn't receive these beans, I'd be able to see, um, well, who did he receive the beans from? I'd be able to see, oh, he, he bought them from Farmer 3 with this um, kind of trail of um, communication history and transaction history. And, you know, there's, there's, there's pros and cons to that, or I would say, you know, potential um, issues of doing that, you know, like how how much information do you want to like in this communication step, how much information do you want to be public facing? Do you want um, like amounts of, of product that's being purchased? Do you want the price that's being, um, that these products are being purchased for? 
um, for example, an issue that could be that could arise in this setting is if you make the um, the price that's being um, the, the price that uh, a, a agent is being that the price that a, a party is paying for a product shown on the blockchain, then that could be um, you know harmful to that that company or that's you know showing this information out into the world because you know that maybe they they have a certain deal with um you know a certain provider a certain um distributor for um you know affordable prices um for shipping this product or distributing this product or having this um raw materials being processed um and it, it could also um be detrimental to a company's competitive advantage because then if this if the, these prices that these um, agents in this blockchain are transacting in are public, then a competitor seeing this uh, these prices on the blockchain could then use that in their their you know business strategy to then you know outcompete this um, company or the these actors in this blockchain based supply chain network. So those are things that we we are consider like considering we have written down. Um, so we're trying to be careful in like what kind of information do we want to keep public and you know since this is still on the drawing board we're still trying to surface as many issues as we can in this setting um, the actions um, in this box here portray what um, a user would see on on the front end um, I actually believe these, these two are connected, the communication process and the actions. So um, this, this actions would be, one of these would be the, the receiver side and then the, the, the initiator side. So whoever initiated the transaction would be able to, you know, if, if I'm the manufacturer buying this, um, or sorry, if I'm the farmer selling the 15 packages of coca beans to the manufacturer, how do we then be able to see, you know, after the manufacturer kind of confirms their shipment using our interface, you know, clicking a button or just like, you know, filling out a simple form. Um, the manufacturer, you know, completes that um, form, clicks the button. The farmer would then be able to see on their side that the manufacturer got to the shipment of, in this example, seven um, cocoa packages of cocoa beans and in this in this example they they fulfilled the request of the manufacturer because the manufacturer only asked for seven cocoa beans and they're paying fifteen dollars for it and you know we would have a step for checking the quality um, this step would actually be um, we've been um, ideating that it would be an intermediate step between these um, or sorry, an intermediate step between um, the transfer of the product. So when the farmer is ready to transfer, it'd be a quality check at this point. And at the freight forwarder, when the freight forwarder receives this product from the farmer, we have another quality check. Same, same when the freight forwarder um, delivers the product to the manufacturer, there'd be a, another quality check on the freight forwarder side. That they had successfully sent um, the product of a, the, the quality that they had initially received it at or is, initially received it in at or um, initially received it in when they transacted with the farmer and then the manufacturer you know again would have another quality check receiving the product from the freight forwarder um, and so on and so on um, but you can imagine this you know got shipment could be um, showing information to the farmer of the bad bean scenario where the manufacturer purchased some 15 cocoa beans and then, you know, replies back to the farmer instead of clicking a button that they got the shipment, maybe they click a button that says, um, you know, inadequate shipment or, you know, there's a issue with the shipment. Um, and then, you know, of fulfillments, there wouldn't be any fulfillment, right? There'd be um, something like a 
request for a change in the fifth element, you know, there's probably um, some kind of proposal that the manufacturer, or sorry, yeah, the manufacturer would make to the farmer um, to correct or update the invoice that they had made. And the invoice would be the transaction or the, the contract that the farmer and the manufacturer got into prior to this purchase order here. So the manufacturer in this example could, you know, make a, uh, a request to update the fulfillments in the invoice that they had made in the contract step, you know, and then the farmer would see that, that the manufacturer is making a request to change the fulfillments that he doesn't want to pay the $15. Maybe he wants to pay $5 for the 15 cocoa beans, the 15 packages of cocoa beans because he received, you know, bad quality cocoa beans, or maybe he is missing uh, a package or, you know, several, maybe he doesn't want to pay any, you know, the, the manufacturer would be able to make whatever requests he wants to that initial invoice, that initial um, invoice that was made via a car contract. And in this case, it would be a smart contract that these two would engage in. Um, and, you know, how would we be managing the payments in this setting and and you know with 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 this environment being a potential issue with um the kinds of public facing information that we show to the blockchain you know we don't really want to see we don't want to um show prices onto the blockchain so an idea that one of our um one of, one of my coworkers has had on on this was you know having a smart contract that only manages ownership so that way we can you know still keep track of who is owning what on um, when there's transfer of a product or transfer of a of an item transfer of commodity you know we still want to know who's owning what and that you know this ownership is being transferred and we, you know we'll be able to see the with that with the history of ownership we can then see you know um a lot of the core information that we want to see you know, without, you know, bringing into, into, without making the pricing information transparent. So the ownership, this ownership would be managed by a smart contract and its job would just be to manage who in the form of like uh, ID or a, a, you know, a contract address in, in this setting, um, if there was no users involved. Um, so, you would have an ID representing some agent in this supply chain environment. And that, you know, in this example is farmer two, and it could be the same for any number of parties in this environment. So it could be the ownership, um, just like to map a trail here. As an example, you could have the ownership beginning with the farmer um, in this con uh, smart contract. And then you'd have this ownership of corn being the product being shipped to the freight forwarder and you'd have, you know, another log here coming, showing up in the smart contract that the freight forwarder now has ownership of this corn. And then that corn gets up to the manufacturer and this ownership smart contract updates again. And that's all it would be doing is just updating like who owns what at this step. And it would, you know, it also be doing updating, not just on the product side, but on the, on the agent side. So when the farmer sends the corn to the freight forwarder, the ownership contract would update on the farmer's side that he no longer has ownership of the corn, right? Um, so yeah, it's kind of a lot of information that I was kind of throwing out there and it's also still in development. We're still drafting up designs and coding up a lot of the backend. So this is kind of just a general idea of how we've been thinking through the problem of how do you you know, automate some of these processes and how do you how do you leverage the blockchain and with you know transparency and wanting to post information to the blockchain for all the parties in the network um, to see and to validate the information that's being um, validate the the transaction information or the the, the behaviors that are being um, done in this network you know how, how do you make that information public so then everybody can benefit so it's kind of a general framework that we have right now. And 
um, I'm going to show you a design that we've um, been making for the homepage of the app. So since this is just going to be initially something that we provide the university as a um, educational tool for students in the classroom to learn about how blockchain um, how blockchain works and how supply chain management works and then how supply chain management and blockchain you know can work together to do cool things like automate automating some of these tasks or you know enabling transparency of transactions or of you know different kinds of information in the supply chain um, in a supply chain value chain so what we have here is just a like welcome page and some simulator updates um, you'll note here that what we would want to allow is a student to come in and log in with their UIN and or net ID and password and then I could log in and see my name here um, maybe a picture and you know this this current page would be um, when a user logs in and they had already made an account. So you can think of me, I already had an account and now I'm logging back in. I'd already made some, some, um, yeah, I'd already interacted with this application before, right? I already got, um, uh, made some progress on like some of these courses here. So um, that's what these are here. Um, different courses for this application. But up here would be updates since my last login. So I could have a notification being a new delivery for you know some some package, um, some purchase order, and I could spec this transaction. Um, new purchase orders have been made. I can you know review the transactions. Um, would get a notification that I forgot to send an invoice. So I can click to send that invoice. A notification that I successfully made new purchase orders. I can click to send that invoice and you know etc. So that's kind of the something that we imagine could be useful in this setting. Um, and you would also have here a list of the recent transactions, um, kind of as a, like an updating, uh, continuously updating feed. And you'd have like who they were sent from, that um, amount, probably you wouldn't, wouldn't want that um, publicly on the blockchain, but maybe this would just be something that faces the, um, the, the single user, right? So this wouldn't be something that is publicly known to the blockchain, but just something that would be known to the user. Right, so this would be recent transactions only done on like my side of the supply chain. So what I, what I would be able to see on transactions that I entered into, and when, so I wouldn't be able to see amounts of transactions that other parties in the um, blockchain had entered into. Um, and here would be what I would imagine be you know, helpful video tutorials that would help a student navigate through this whole application because of course this would be a lot to take in initially you know you have to teach students like you know what a blockchain is um, you know they have to know some of some about supply chain management so you know an intro course I imagine would be like how to use the simulator and you could continue on it to see your progress here click the button for more information and you'd have like you know several several lessons in that video course. You know, have other courses on you know, making on, on more advanced topics, making and tracking transactions in this simulator, managing the supply chain in the simulator. You know, which could be done here in this supply chain tab, and more courses down there below. Um, so this is kind of a a general feel of like what we're developing. Um, and the other pages have yet to be developed, but um, this is something I'm going to be working on um, today and more this weekend after a, a meeting today. But one thing that I want to add about this, I uh, just want to check the time here. Um, the, the user would be, um, one thing that we learned with, um, from meeting with a, the supply chain expert, or sorry, the supply chain professor, um, at U of I was that in other supply chain simulators, 
we've seen that the um, the classroom would get broken up into different groups, and the groups would then um, have each member in that group be assigned to some specific role in the supply chain. You know, so you know someone could be um, if there's like four to a group, one could be the sourcer of the commodity, another could be the manufacturer, the processing facility, the third could be the distributor of that um, processed product, and then the fourth could be the customer. And then you can see, um, and you know, each student would be able to see their impacts and their consequences, like their, the consequences of their actions in this um, group um, environment. So we're thinking that we want to do the same thing with this supply chain stimulator where we have, you know, in, the, in that framework that we had, we had, a, you know, a few agents in the network. We had a farmer, freight forwarder, a manufacturer, and a customer. So we're thinking that the professor with the supply chain stimulator could assign, um, you know, break the classroom into groups and then assign, you know, some, some amount of roles, you know, whether that's like three, four, five, and we're still working on, but you know, they could assign a role specific to a, assign a role specifically to a student, and that student would then log in as that role. And then upon login, they would specify what role they're taking in the supply chain simulator, and then the simulator will then present them with the with the proper user interface for that specific role. So then, the transaction history, the um, courses, the updates would then be specific to that specific role that that student is playing in this setting. You know, and, and I think that that gives students an idea of, you know, how how that role plays a part in the supply chain and then how how um, how 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 teamwork is an important factor in these kinds of environments where, you know, you, you need to rely on um, the other parties that are in your supply chain, um, even in a, a blockchain-based environment, right? Um, so, yeah, that's um, our design, and um, yeah, that was that was my um, spiel on supply chain simulator. Um, any questions or um, opinions, feedback, criticisms? Yeah, um, is the um, is the stuff that you showed um, available for us to play with as well? Yeah, um, so in this slideshow, I, let me share my screen again. I can do that, All right. So in the slideshow, I, you guys can see my screen, right? Okay, so in the slideshow, um, this design here is navigated to by this link right here in this um, slide. So, you know, it's after this, little model that I presented, click on that link and then you can see, you know, the design I made and you can play around with it. Um, it's a copy that I made of my, my own um, design that I'm like currently working on. So you can, you know, take this and, you know, you know, analyze it, make notes to it if you want um, or comment on it. Uh, yeah. And I'll share that um, on the meetup page actually. So that way it's um, can be found easily. Sounds great, thanks. Yeah. So I'm curious, you use blockchain, but if this is just a simulator for students, you could have done this with, you know, the database. So yeah. Yeah, talk about that. Yeah. Um, so why a blockchain and um, you know why blockchain over a database? Um, 
not no no real reason why over a blockchain over a database we why we chose blockchain and didn't consider a database was because the college of business reached out to us and my, this blockchain student organization that i lead on campus so they reached out to us um wanting some help with um like some blockchain i blockchain projects um that they had ideas for and that they wanted to work on so to have th these blockchain projects would be like educational um kind of modules so the the department that this is for is the disruption lab which is this new um, emerging technology um curriculum that uh, the Gies College of Business is going to be offering to students um, in the future. So um, they just reached out to us wanting to build a blockchain application. And some ideas that we were talking about was a supply chain simulator. And we thought it was a great idea to you know pursue. And nobody really questioned why, why not a database? Um, but you know, me considering that now, why not a database? We could have easily used a database in this setting and made a supply chain simulator. And it probably would be, um, you know, if we had the, a database, uh, someone with database experience on our team, you know, we could have easily built this supply chain simulator with a database. Um, there would have been you know, some minor differences in terms of like what information is being shown to the user or to the student when they're um, accessing this application. Um, one of the things that we, there was one of the things that I think would be benef more beneficial in the blockchain based setting would be the transparency of some kind of general information. So, so like in the, in that model that I was showing, like whether a, whether party A or party B uh, received some shipment or whether they had a defect in um, the product that they received. You know, that could be in this, in this simulated environment, um, you know, pushed out to the whole chain and then everybody could see that. Um, and doing that in the database environment, um, you could do, but I, I don't see it as being efficient in the blockchain-based setting. In the blockchain-based setting, you have this public database um, that's shared between all the parties in the supply chain. Yeah, I have a thought about, uh, for example, the kind of what kind of information to share between each parties. I mean, for this kind of question, have you thought about it uh, from an uh, economics uh, point of view, for example, because it sounds like it's very game theory and uh, I mean, yeah. that's organization kind of stuff. And uh, I mean, I'm just mm -hmm. wondering if I mean, you, you have been thinking about something like that. Yeah, um, we, I can, I can, I, yeah, there's, there's a lot of like economic underlying this, this whole yeah. simulator and no, we haven't really thought about um, any economic theory or, you know, game theory, but I can imagine that we could easily, you know, add that to um, the, the application, for example, one of the things that um, my partner was thinking of is adding dynamic pricing into the application. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, so like if, if I bought a, you know, because in the real world, you have uh, prices for commodities changing, right? You know, price of gold, the price of corn, you know, it's not the same, um, you know, month after month. So you, we could we could add like dynamic pricing and then have, you know, some party paying for corn, like one minute paying, um, you know, $10 and then another party in another uh, group in the same class, you know, also being, you know, buy an agent that buys the corn could pay like $15, you know, different price. Um, and I, I see, I see value in that, but we, we haven't really considered, considered that like when my friend brought up that mm -hmm. that thought we were thinking it would be too complex to implement um into an application since we're trying to you know, actually build the thing for people to use mm -hmm. um 
but that I see that definitely as you know, an opportunity for you know more people to come on to work on the project in the future. Yeah. Good question, though. On one of your earlier slides, you talked about breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs to track what was going on. Is that just events and logs that you're emitting, or is that something different or something more? Yeah, so it's basically events um, in uh, on Ethereum. So um, they would basically be um, events that we choose to emit because mm -hmm. we, you know we can make an event off any kind of inf information information that's happening on the blockchain. So you know we could make an event for um, party A paying the twenty dollars for corn. Um, to party B, yep. but we don't want to emit like all the information that's been going on, that's happening on the blockchain. We only want to admit information that we think is critical for all the agents in the blockchain to know. Um, and we also want to have things like quality checks and have quality checks also be emitted, like information of a quality check be emitted to the whole blockchain. So that way, um, you know, students could see that, you know, this product that was, you know, finally received by a customer has passed the quality checks, you know, all the way down, like beginning at the, at the sourcer where that product was, you know, sourced from, you know, with, by the raw materials. Um, so, yeah, we, we actually thought quite a bit about events and like what kind of events do we want to admit since we have in this scenario we have like um, full control over the kinds of information we want to push to the blockchain so um, yeah all, all the public information is being um, done using events on both on solidity in um, in solidity we're making events and then emitting them and then on the front end um, we're just capturing those events and then presenting that in a easy, easily digestible format. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, I'll ask one more. Any other? Did, did you look, did you look yeah. at either, either to, like, you talked about pricing and then not wanting to show it because it's confidential, but did you look at the, mm -hmm. whether it's a good idea to use ether or you have, your own coin or how you do that pricing if you did it. Yeah, um, we've definitely thought about it. That's what we were thinking about doing initially. But um, in the simulated environment, it would, it could be, um, you know, a, a bit, it, it would add more yeah. complexity to the application. Yeah. And with students coming into the application, you know, they would log in with a, with a wallet and then be taught like, what is the value of ether and then how to transact with ether, you know, and then in, you're, then you're tasked with um, teaching them like the value of money or whether ether is a, a currency or not, you know, um, and you know, whether they should be using ether for, you know, paying for some product or why, why not use dollars, you know? Um, so, in this setting, we're thinking about just having um, pre-programmed amounts of money. So everybody could start off with like, you know, some, some amount of dollars that would be assigned, you know, as soon as they log in, they would have, you know, like a thousand dollars and would just be managing that amount. Um, but in the future, I, I could definitely see that happening where, you know, we have like test ether because you could definitely do mm -hmm. run this application in, with uh, on like an Ethereum test net and then give everyone test ether. Um, but I don't think we're there yet for giving everyone like ether yeah. um, for them to play around with. Um, so yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Got a minute left. Yeah, I, got I don't know if anyone. Quick question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. 
from a developer's point of view, how long does it take to build? How long have you been working on this? And how long do you think it's going to take to get to the end? Yeah, uh, well, to be honest, I see there's no end. There's, there's, <laughs> I mean, this, this project was going to be uh, something that the university wanted to continue working on. Um, but I guess like the first version, when that first version would be done, um, I'm going to be working on this during the summer and so are the other people that I've been working with. Um, so I would imagine I'm, I'm in charge of the front end and I've been, you know, working on some front end this whole semester. So, um, I would say probably a month and a half, probably like by the end of next summer, we would have like a good working prototype, but we, we probably wouldn't be there for the students to use. So yeah, it's going to take a while. Um, but yeah, we would have a, we'd have a working MVP by, sure. by the start of the fall. So like success would be defined as more, more along the lines of like, look, this is a new thing. We did it and it, and it works. Not so much yeah. like there's tons of people using it. Not that that wouldn't be great, but um, success is, right. yeah. is just having a we, working feature. Well, we, we want students to end up using it, but, um, you know, we're, we're not, I, I think the, the directors of the disruption lab mm -hmm. aren't sure yet how they would want to organize a class around it. Um, oh, yeah. I'm not even sure if they've, if they've really put in much planning into what kind of class they could, um, you know, add to the curriculum for, for teaching students about blockchain supply chain management at the same time. Um, so yeah, I, I think they, they, what, what they've been really um, focused on is, you know, seeing, wanting to see that, that we can actually build an application that would work. So what would you say is like, like the, most, the most painful part about building, uh, building over the top of the blockchain? Um, definitely like what kinds of, what kinds of events do you want to emit? So mm -hmm. like what kinds of information do you want to capture and then show to the blockchain and show to users and how, how you want to present that information? Mm -hmm. It's probably the, those are like the most di two difficult things. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Just, I'm just curious who, who initiated this, this whole product in the first place? Is it a college of, is it Gies or? In, apparently they don't know how to incorporate this into a curriculum yet, so right. So yeah, yeah, it was it was it was the disruption lab, which is now part of Gies, and yeah, they I I haven't really been in talks with them about like in our discussions they haven't really been talking about what they would want to to do in terms of like course wise and like you know what what would be the topics for the course, but they they have been very verbal about what they want students to do in terms of like interacting with this application. So, you know, learning about blockchain fundamentals and learning about block, uh, supply chain management and being able to learn about very core elements of supply chain management and how, how supply chain management could be improved or sped up via like automation with a, a blockchain based environment. Very nice, very cool. Thanks, yeah. Still, still very much in development. How, how, many, how many of you are working on this project? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it was quite a lot and then it just dropped, you know, with the coronavirus. Uh, okay. um, so it's been, it's been only three of us. Um, me on the front end and like design and kind of leading the group and then one person on focus on the back end coding in solidity and then another person helping with um, supply chain management. Pretty impressive stuff. Thanks. Is there, yeah. ways, is there ways that this current team could contribute to your project or is that kind of private closed off? Um, you mean those three people? No, like if we wanted to get involved. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm sure the 
the disruption lab would be like really happy to have more people involved. Um, the professor that leads the disruption lab, his name is um, uh, Robert. Uh, I'm trying to remember his last name. Uh, I'm just looking that up really quick. Yeah, I've been wanting to get more involved in blockchain stuff, but uh, the uh, the initial hump seems to be too big for me to get over. So maybe having a project like this where I could step in and just sort of see how things are going and do some easy stuff would be a good way for me to get initiated. Yeah, uh, Professor Robert Brunner is his name. Um, he used to be a professor in um, Loomis uh, teaching astronomy. Um, teaching astrophysics, actually, yeah. Um, yeah, he, he's now leads the disruption lab. I can post his email address. Um, his email address is kind of amusing. So we would just um, send him an email and tell him what we're thinking, see if we could get involved. Yeah. Um, he's really looking, you know, to have this project be something that um, students could really use and learn from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's his actual Thanks. email address. Yeah, you're welcome. Do you guys post a Git? Do you have GitHub? Do you put stuff up on GitHub? I did. Yeah, um, I can I can share that too. But it um, I, I shared that in the last slide, and to be honest, we haven't really touched the GitHub since because we okay. we sort of focusing more on gathering more, because we were initially developing it first, you know, not really knowing much about supply chain management. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we we're talking more with um, one of our advisors who's part of Disruption Lab about, um, you know, where are we capturing all the right information in this mm -hmm. front facing application? And, you know, we, we weren't really, so we, we decided to just stop on the development and then just focus on the overall design of how we wanted to structure the application. Okay. Um, yeah, and making, you know, making sure we were getting all the information, all the details about supply chain management um, before we go into developing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once you get to that point, I'd be curious to see your solidity stuff, your, your contracts, just see how you- Oh work. yeah, definitely. I, I would definitely be happy, very happy to share that. Um, so as far as like sending you guys ether, um, I can, I can do that now if you guys have, um, your Ethereum public addresses handy. And if you guys wanted to like, just paste that into the chat, I'll like send you guys each like, uh, 15, $15 worth of ether. I, I don't have a wallet yet. <laughs> oh, you don't? Oh. I've got a Ethereum array. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you do. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I like keep this as a thing because I, I want people to like, I want more people in this, you know, community to be, you know, excited about blockchain and, you know, crypto and ether and like more about the applications and like what you can do with ether. Um, so I'll try to keep this as a thing for as long as I'm here. Um, like just giving out ether for people that, you know, want it, want some, you know, try using it for uh, whatever. Did you say that MetaMask would work? Yeah, MetaMask works. I think I downloaded a while, a long time ago, and I can't remember where I put it. Oh yeah, I have to be. That's on Brave, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I actually use Brave for for my wallet. 
But yeah, MetaMask works because two. All right, let me see if I can okay. find it. If I can, that's fine. All right, let's see. Someone sent me there. I'm gonna send some. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. No problem. All right, I just sent that. It's pending. We should make some unique tokens for our meetings, for people to collect. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be interesting. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd imagine that the, as Ethereum grows, people, you know, could make like you know meme tokens. I mean, people already did, but as as you know, solidity programming becomes more popular. I think, you know, we'll have like high school kids, you know, making a, making their own token for like, you know, I don't know, like a side project or, you know, a club, like, like decentralized autonomous organizations kind of got popular, um, like for the past like seven months, let's say, um, probably like over the past year. Um, and they're kind of like online mobs, but like online friendly mobs, online friendly mobs of developers. Um, so stuff like that would be cool. I've got to hop off here in a couple minutes. Um, do you want to take over host if, if anyone wants to keep going playing with stuff or do we want to wrap up or anything? Um, if no one else has got anything to add, well, I think wrapping up would be good. It's good for like the, the viewers. Too. For everyone watching at home. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing this project with us. This has been really cool. Um, it's awesome to see this kind of, you know, stuff going on here at the U of I. And even, you know, um, interesting how like this is a project that doesn't necessarily have to be on blockchain, but by making it on the blockchain, the people who are potentially going to be using it can see how the blockchain systems work and come to understand. Yeah why they're valuable. And I think that that's the biggest, you know, that's one of the biggest hurdles right now towards getting more people into the system is that um, people just don't understand um, any, any of the basics. And so if you start right. off with, yeah. with like, yeah, this could be done with a database um, at this small of a scale, but we're doing it on blockchain because if you imagine us taking, scaling this up to being a global system, putting on a database then would no longer be manageable. So I think mm -hmm. that that's, uh, that's been a really great thing to display. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're just trying to focus on getting it done now, like actually building the thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited that uh, you guys like it. Uh, we haven't really shown it to people. No, it'll be a really good example. I mean, I, I could see how well this could work. Because um, mm -hmm. at the UI level, it's just it's just putting transactions in and looking at results. But underneath it, you've got the blockchain that people can start mm -hmm. understanding why that's important and what you can do with it. Excellent proof of concept. Yeah, yeah it really is. And supply chain's got a huge interest. I mean, blockchain and supply chain are one of the first areas that's really taken off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, I was like noticing that uh, too. Um, and like coincidentally, we started this project and like, you know, got committed to working on this project um, before this like whole virus crisis, like, you know, came to be. Um, so it's kind of, kind of funny that, we're, you know, uh, 
that it's kind of like the perfect timing for this project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of interest in blockchain because of all the weirdness that was going on in supply chains for medical supplies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, your timing's good. All right. Yeah. Well, Jason, thanks again. Better yeah, thanks. Good work. Keep it up. Excellent. Yeah, thank you guys for having me.